Thanks for the introduction. And these bones have been on a long trip to get here. That trip is outlined in red here. You heard about the live stranding and necropsy, the travel and exhumation to uh, Fort DeSoto. From there, the bones went to the Bonehenge Whale Center in Beaufort, North Carolina for further processing. And then up here to um, the Mu Smithsonian's Museum Support Center in Suitland, Maryland. I'm just gonna cover the last two steps of this trip. Word about Bonehenge, this had the feel of a community barn raising. A charitable nonprofit purchased a piece of land, demolished a house. This was built by volunteers, and after a year of building, that's what it looks like today. This is where a lot of the work I'm about to describe took place. When John Asoski was making plans to go to Florida, Fort DeSoto, to exhume the skeleton, he called me up. He said, Keith, do you think you could help us prepare these bones for the Smithsonian? And no one was around to temper my enthusiasm, and I said, hell yeah. Um, I got the perfect spot, we'll dig a shallow, sandy grave, they'll be ready in two years. And he said, no, 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 Keith, you're gonna compost it, and it'll be ready in a matter of months. And I said, I don't know anything about composting. And he said, I'll teach you. And so he did, and he gave me a bit of a chore list. I was to gather a bunch of wood chips, a whole lot of fresh horse manure, a lot of hay, and some fencing, important ingredients for a successful composting setup. And in Beaufort, we've got volunteers who will just do anything with brilliance and dedication, and they comb the county in their trucks, gathering these materials, and um, shout out to uh, Pixie and Rumor, the horses that provided the manure. Uh, <laughs> and they started to deliver the components to the Bonehenge Whale Center. At this point, our job was just to wait for John's arrival. And he did arrive with a very stinky load. Um, and he backed it up to a bed of compost that we had prepared. And component by component, still a lot of flesh attached, uh, we unloaded them from the trailer onto the compost. So this is the skull coming off with the jaws still attached. All the components were handled this way. Um, the components that had small bones, like the flippers or the caudal vertebrae we wrapped in nylon netting, because we didn't want to lose any of the little bones through this process. Made a map of the contents of the compost so we could be oriented when we went back in. And by the end of the day, it either didn't stink anymore or we just got used to it, but this is what it looked like. And we had set up a watering system, and underneath that mound is the uh, adult male 40-foot what we were referring to as the Gulf of Mexico Brutus whale. We installed um, thermometers like this one in various places to monitor the compost temperature over time in red. This is the air temperature over time in blue. And we kept track of when water was applied, uh, either by watering or rain. These beetles are native. Um, they are shown here on bone, and lots of them found their way into the compost pile, and we are glad to see them. They're very effective at gently getting flesh off bone. Five and a half months later, it was time to exhume it. A friend of mine had a forklift, and he brought it over to lift the skull with the upper jaws attached off the mandibles. He placed it on a temporary cart, and we'll get back to that in a minute. And then a big crew of colleagues and coworkers, volunteers, students assembled to exhume the rest of it. And we had a bit of an orientation in the Bone Hendridge Whale Center, which is shown here, where we discussed baleen whale anatomy, the importance of the specimen, and the goal for the day. Nobody gets hurt, and we get all the bones out of the compost pile. Then it was time to move outside, we set up a supplies table, very helpful, and then slowly started to remove the compost off the bones to reveal them. I mean, this is that process well underway. So you see uh, the coolest thing I'd like to bring to your attention is that there's not a lot of, whole, lot of flesh on them. This method appears to have worked. Paul is pointing to the cervical vertebrae. It looks like Muriel has her hands on a couple of ribs. So these ribs are gonna come out of the compost pile and onto a processing table, which is how we handled all the bones. So this is a 
five vertebrae that are attached with soft tissue still, they'll take a lot of work. There's some more flesh attached to it, but they're going to a processing table, as is the scapula. And we did a lot of photography and a lot of labeling because we want to document what we had and we wanted to document that we left nothing. Uh, sometimes we had to get creative with the labeling, but uh, <laughs> we do what we can with what we got. <laughs> You, you can't tell what's in this package, but it's leaving the compost pile to the processing table, and you still can't quite tell what it is, but after about 20 minutes of cleaning and cutting, that turned into that. So that was one of the flippers. And it's often an oh wow moment to a lot of people when they realize that the flippers in a whale is very similar to our own arms, including phalanges arranged into digits. Lots of rinsing, lots of rinsing, uh, John, John is really happy here, and if he's happy, I'm happy. <laughs> um, so it was working out well, and he's separating a few of the vertebrae that were still attached by soft tissue in this picture. Lunchtime, the power of pizza. After lunch, we looked for a, an oak tree branch that was big enough to handle the skull, and we lifted it off the cart to do some more cleaning and rinsing. You're looking at the right side of the skull, the rostral trips of the upper jaws are to the right of the image. Oh, right there. Um, and now I'm in front of the skull. You're looking at the palate, I guess you'd call that. Baleen was here. Baleen was here. Just, just kind of to orient you. The end game for the day was to get all the bones laid out on a couple of tarps we had uh, laid down on the ground and take lots of photos to document all the work the people in the skeleton. And we did take time for some fun photos. This is a uh, the talented and experienced and bright team of uh, uh, Lincoln Memorial University uh, posing next to it and uh, grateful for their enthusiasm for this project. Sun was setting, shadows getting low, we put a ladder on the bed of a pickup truck and took this photo. This is the group that helped with the exhumation and I just gotta say the Bonehenge Whale Center um, doesn't have a permanent staff. The nonprofit is not an employer. So anything done here is done by students volunteers, coworkers, and colleagues. And at the risk of leaving someone out, I just wanted to give a shout out to them. Their names are on the blue table on the left and uh, organizations that they represented on the purple table on the right. So big shout out to them. Uh, and by the end of the day, we got all the bones loaded up and down our trucks, headed north to the Smithsonian's Museum Support Center in Suitland, Maryland, and this is the Osteo Prep Lab. We are raising the skull off the truck and bringing it on the deck of the lab. These bones have a lot of work still ahead of them. Cleaning, degreasing, and a lot of hand cleaning required. On the back of the Osteo Prep Lab, uh, lots of stainless steel tanks. All of these bones will go through multiple soaks. Ammonia solution, then water, and sometimes repeat and the soaking was to loosen up the remaining flesh so that could be cut away. So these look like the cervical vertebrae and a mystery bone down there, but um, they will turn out very clean. Uh, there was no receptacle big enough for the skull, and this is just a beautiful example of doing the best work with what you got at the time. And John made a pond of sorts inside the osteoprep lab in which to soak the skull, which is inside uh, this tarp shown here. The destination for all these bones was the whalebone collection in the same campus, the Museum Support Center, and that's what you're seeing here. There are ribs on the deck. You see a scapula uh, leaning against the crate, the um, mandibles, oh, and uh, okay, we got this. Tech? <laughs> oh. I'd like to go three slides prior. Yeah, yeah, five slides prior. We'll get back there. We'll get back here. Three more. One, one more. Okay, well, all this was leading up, everything you heard today was leading up to this moment. And this is a. Uh, Patty Roselle and her team with some of the Smithsonian folks lowering the skull onto foam 
about to take more measurements and photos than most of us thought were even possible before today. Uh, and it, to expose the dorsal surface. So lots of measurements of the entire skull with the upper jaw bones, lots of measurements of the individual components within the skull, the individual bones that make up the skull, and measurements of the spaces between the bones. Terrific photos like this of the left scapula, which shows a well-heeled V-shaped fracture and some evidence of bru bruising. No clue what caused the fracture, but these bones still have a lot to teach us. Digital 3D scanning was done to produce images such as this. The exhibits uh, workshop created this fabulous rack, wheels on the bottom, wheels on the back, custom made to hold the skull and jaws of this unique specimen. So this will go onto that cart. And this is a, every bone and the cart will have this label no longer identifying it as the Gulf of Mexico Brutus whale, but as the holotype for the Rice's whale. This is an incredibly important and valuable specimen, and so is the skull on the other side of John. And he and the team just uh, strapped it down onto the cart, um, and it's on wheels, so they could wheel it outside. The photography team put some, black, uh, some white plastic behind it to create contrast for photos taken like this. Um, to produce an image like this. And just to orient you, uh, you're looking at the ventral surface of the skull and upper jaws, the palate, and the mandibles in this image are on the back when in life they would actually be on our side of it. Uh, just to orient you in case you speak this language, thanks to Paul Nader for helping me with the terminology. I hope I got it right. I'm gonna put a little cir couple circles on the bottom to indicate bones that are not present we have them, but they're just not present. Um, I'm guessing the ears were very loosely articulated, which wouldn't surprise me. And so they were in the compost beneath the skull when we raised the skull up. And those are the two um, ears or tympanic bullet um, that came out of the compost. And after degreasing and rinsing and flipping over, that's what they look like today. John tells me too many people to list. And so I'm just giving a shout out to the Smithsonian teams um, that work with all, within all these divisions of the Smithsonian who contributed to this work all the way up to what we can present to you today. So big shout out to their great work. This is your skull. This is our skull. This is for research, education, exhibits, outreach, this symposium, and you might even see it on a t-shirt one day. So this is gonna, this still has a lot to teach us, and it will, because it's in very good hands. When I say it's your skull, all the data, all the photos are available to you. They're on the museum's website. This is just a screen capture. And just digging one click deeper reveals the photos that were presented today, the stranding data, the necropsy results, and also um, a terrific poster that Denise Boyd and team put together uh, that described the necropsy and the results. Every stranding call we get, I wince. I wince about the fear of another example of the death toll we're taking on these endangered um, marine wildlife. And it sometimes gets demoralizing, and I know many of you feel this way too. But when I see the number of people spanning so many organizations over many states that have contributed to everything that's been presented today, that really inspires me. It keeps me going, it gives me hopes, and so thanks for that. And also, you all in this crowd and all of you tuning in online, um, you're here to learn, or well, maybe you're here because your teacher made you come here, but still, uh, yeah, maybe you were involved in this or you'd like to be involved in this. Uh, that's another source of inspiration for me, is just the fact that you're tuning in, and I thank you for that. There's a lot of work left to be done, and we need all the help we can get. Meanwhile, back in Beaufort, we have a huge compost pile with no bones to um, treat, so what are we doing? We're growing watermelons. <laughs> They're kind of like whales. <laughs> so, uh, thank you.
Does anyone have any questions for Keith? Or comments? All right, well, thanks a lot, Keith.